Okay, I think today uh, we'll, we'll uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, I think we should just get started without much ado because we uh, already met Dr. Nadkarni yesterday. So she's going to um, tell you a bit more about synapses today. I and mean, we're starting with maybe some channels, but also moving on to synapses. So Hita? Right. Um, okay, I'm going do need to stop my video, unfortunately, because of uh, this hardware issues with the laptop, but anyway. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you had some chance to mull over uh, some of the uh, topics we sped fast uh, uh, with yesterday. Um, I promise to let you in on some of the details soon enough when I have a spot of time. Um, especially the GHK equation, I know it was sort of just a statement, um, definitely deserves more thought and I'll, I'll, I'll write up the derivation and uh, put it up on uh, you know, the Slack channels or whatever. Um, so uh, where we were at yesterday was that um, uh, we were talking about, um, well, we kind of went over, uh, in some detail, how an action potential is generated, and specifically the Hodgkin Huxley model. And then we uh, 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 spent a lot of time thinking about uh, potassium and sodium ion channels. And we said that uh, these two channels were sort of quintessential uh, in generating uh, any form of action potential. So we needed a fast sodium channel that would depolarize the membrane, and, uh, and, and a potassium channel which would be slow, which would repolarize the membrane. Uh, uh, and then we went on to say that, look, uh, you know, now that we understand this whole, how this whole thing works, uh, we can now look at, um, uh, we can look at other kinds of channels. And it just turns out there's a whole zoo of channels. Um, and that it's a basis of, on basis of these ion channels that neurons have a very rich uh, dynamical repertoire. They, they, can, they can fire really fast. They can change their speed given activity. They can fire in bursts, and they can even fire when they are hyperpolarized. And we uh, looked at uh, how that would be so, um, it, it, the rebound firing. Um, this is another particular channel that I do feel like I should uh, go over with some amount of detail, and that's the calcium activated potassium channel. And this is a very, very useful channel. It's, 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 it's extremely important in generating rhythms uh, and I'm sure you'll uh, uh, look at CPG, central pattern generators, and then you might sort of think about this channel that we spoke about in the first couple of lectures. So this is a potassium channel, but unlike all the channels that we have looked at so far, this actually um, does not, um, does not um, uh, depend on voltage, but it depends on calcium. So what you see here um, are a bunch of action potentials are being fired. Each of these action potential allows uh, calcium to come in. Uh, now, again, this particular channel, the I AHP channel, is, is a slow channel. Uh, by the way, the AHP stands for after hyperpolarization. Um, and so this calcium channel specifically is voltage dependent. So every action potential uh, uh, gives this one push and it uh, opens, and then uh, calcium comes in. And then this kind of uh, opens the, uh, the potassium channel. Now potassium channel um, is, a, is a slow channel. So it show, shows this cumulative effect. So before it, uh, uh, of, of the calcium opening and, and the activation keeps going up, up, up. And you know what happens when potassium channel is open, right? Um, when potassium channel is open, potassium flows out um, and it lowers the overall excitability of uh, of the neuronal membrane, right? So it, it makes it harder and harder uh, for the neuron to fire action potentials. And this is what you see here, right? It starts off by, uh, the neuron starts off by firing really, really rapidly. And then it seems to uh, slow down and eventually it'll stop. Um, I'm gonna give you one um, specific example of this. Uh, these are two neurons which are actually uh, uh, inhibitively coupled, meaning they don't excite each other, but they actually, uh, when one neuron fires, it kind of makes sure that it stops the other neuron from firing action potentials. And this kind of coupling um, is, is, is called inhibitory coupling. Um, it's, it's very common motif in, in all brain areas. In fact, um, it's, it's again central to any kinds of, uh, if you think of uh, 
the brain as a pattern generating machine, uh, then you can't do without uh, inhibited coupling, okay? So here's this sort of a cartoon uh, uh, case of two neurons which are inhibitively coupled. And, uh, you know, because uh, of some differences in initial condition, this green neuron seems to um, fire uh, action potentials first, right? Both of them have been given some exactly the same stimulus. And again, I want you to sort of uh, keep this back of your mind because you will come across this motives uh, later on in the course, I'm sure. So uh, this neuron starts to fire. Uh, the green neuron, uh, it is inhibitively coupled uh, to the orange neuron. And because of the inhibitive coupling, uh, it makes sure that the orange neuron does not fire. Now, this, but both these neurons have the AHP shell. So what this does is eventually the neuron stops to fire because there's a buildup of uh, this red guy, which is the potassium conductance, or in this, uh, I guess I'm showing calcium, which is sort of equivalent to saying that the potassium AHP current is getting activated. So the activation of the AHP current goes up, gets the green neuron to fire. The minute the green neuron uh, stops firing, uh, the orange neuron comes up, right? And the orange neuron starts to fire. So you sort of get this back and forth activity, uh, which is the most simple form of pattern that you can get. And you can have as complicated a pattern as you want if you have a bunch of um, inhibitively connected um, neurons. Okay, so I think uh, we sort of, glossed over uh, broadly in broad strokes about action potentials and different kind of ion channels and how they can give rise to uh, 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 the whole repertoire of action potentials, right, or firing patterns. Um, now, what happens next, right? This uh, uh, action potential that is generated somewhere um, needs to propagate, needs to talk to other neurons. Um, so I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but the way uh, an action potential propagates down an axon is that the depolarization caused by uh, uh, the initial action potential uh, jump starts um, uh, a bunch of sodium channels, which are sort of in the vicinity of that uh, 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 first set of sodium channels. And that triggers another action potential. And so therefore there's no loss of information here, right? As long as the uh, stimulus is above uh, threshold, you keep getting these beautiful looking stereotypical excursions um, in voltage space. Now, the other thing to think about, or I'm sure you've again heard this, that action potentials are unidirectional. Where does this uh, unidirectionality come from? Um, and this again, you sort of, I, I ask you to invoke what you learned yesterday. And this is, uh, the secret lies in the refractory period. Remember when I showed you the beautiful waveform uh, of the potential, um, it took a bit of time to come back to resting. So it, 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 there was depolarization and there's, there was repolarization and it sort of swept across the voltage phase, which was even more negative than the resting potential. And it took its own sweet time to come back to resting uh, 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 membrane potentials after uh, after being even more hyperpolarized, and this but in this particular period, it's difficult to fire action potential. So uh, this is called, what we call the refractory period, and it's this refractory period that makes it uh, uh, possible for the action potential to be unidirectional. And you sort of have to think of it like a sparkler, right? You're burning out the sodium channels, or you know, you're burning out that. A uh, patch of um, uh, membrane, and therefore you can't go back. Just keep going forward. Okay. Um, the other thing to uh, uh, I would like to invoke here is is the fact that your neuronal membranes are actually quite leaky, right? And, you, and of course, it's they are, they are permeable to a certain kind of ions, but it's a leaky membrane. So uh, if you I'd like you to compare it to a, a leaky uh, water hose, um, and so if if you have a leaky water hose, uh, the fatter it is, the less water you will waste, right? You, it's a, water chooses path of least resistance, right? And so uh, in a similar fashion, uh, if you want these action potentials to travel down an axon really rapidly, uh, you want most of the sodium ions to flow down the axon rather than go out. And, and, and so you, you would, end up wanting to have, or the design would have, would, would need the axons to be really, really fat. And this would make your head 
really, really uh, fat, right? A huge head that couldn't fit through a barn door. As it turns out, uh, we, it, it, uh, you know, probably not a perfect design, but it's not that bad. Um, the way we have gotten around or evolution has gotten around uh, us having fat, big fat heads, some of us still do, uh, is, is, is by having insulation, right? So this insulating layer is provided by glia. Uh, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the Schwann cells in the PNS, it's oligodendrocyte in, in the uh, CNS. Um, and so uh, the way this whole thing works is that there are little gaps between this insulation. And this is, these are the gaps where you have the sodium channels, uh, and uh, so the action potential opportunistically reaches this road, what are called nodes of Ranier, uh, which has a extensive concentration of sodium channels and then jump starts another action potential, right? So it's this kind of jumping of action potential is called solitary propagation. It's, it's what allows our axons to be reasonably sized and makes uh, propagation um, rather fast, right? Uh, and so this is just to give you a sense of what it is like to have uh, myelination. This is sort of uh, two movies that compare, uh, give you a realistic sort of uh, description of difference of speed when you would have um, um, myelination as opposed to when you don't have uh, myelination. You get a sense of the, the big difference myelination makes? All right, so, uh, okay. So now um, let's assume that the poor action potential has been traveling from somewhere close to the cell body all the way down to the axon. Uh, what happens next? Uh, if you assume that information is indeed carried by these uh, voltage pulses, then we need to make sure that it, this sort of gets transmitted to other neurons. Now this process is, is called a synaptic transmission. Um, this term was coined by Charles Sherrington. Uh, you can imagine synaptic transmission is a large, of course, a fascinating topic. Uh, and if you believe, uh, especially since we all believe that uh, synapses is where all the excitement happens, right? Synapses is where learning is initiated. So there's no reason to believe that it would be a, a simple um, a process. Okay, so there are two ways uh, by which uh, synaptic transmission uh, can take place. Um, the, there's chemical synaptic transmission and there's electrical synaptic transmission. Um, let's talk about electrical synaptic transmission first. So uh, in this scenario, basically ion current passes from one cell to the other via what, what are called gap junctions. Uh, these are basically channels that allow ions to pass from cytoplasm uh, of one cell to the cytoplasm of the other. Uh, these are coordinated by these special proteins uh, called connexins which are basically the large uh, bi-directional pores. Uh, pores. Uh, now, these are amongst the fastest uh, synapses. Uh, so you can imagine they, uh, they, uh, they might be found in, uh, in parts of uh, the nervous system where you need things to be fast. So for example, they are very common uh, synapses between the sensory motor neuron, um, and, and, the, uh, and the muscle uh, fibers. And this, these kind of uh, synapses uh, mediate uh, escape reflexes, right? Uh, having said that, uh, electrical synapses also are common uh, in every part of the mammalian brain, okay? All right, so um, chemical synaptic transmission, why uh, is it uh, special? Um, uh, sorry, electrical, uh, uh, Electrical, uh, I, I, you know, I need to correct this. This is actually remind me to fix this. I'm talking about electrical uh, synaptic transmission here. Um, electrical synaptic transmission is fast, it's rel reliable, uh, it's probably energetically more efficient, uh, it allows for sub threshold signals to be uh, transmitted. Um, and so, um, this is. Everything about this is in contrast to chemical synaptic transmission. Now, chemical synaptic transmission actually turns out to be energetically highly expensive. Uh, there, it, it can be it's slower. Um, it, it, it can only allow about the short signal. So you need an action potential to generate a chemical synaptic transmission event. Um, so why act, do we have a prevalence of 
chemical synapses in our brain as opposed to electrical synapses. Um, any thoughts on that? Feel free to put it up in the chat. Uh, is it just that we are endowed with a terrible, terrible design? Uh, and it's something to think about, right? So uh, everything I've said so far makes um, electrical synaptic transmission way, way better than um, chemical synaptic transmission, except, except the most important thing that your brain is supposed to be. Your brain is supposed to be plastic. Um, and what, what chemical synaptic transmission allows for is uh, plasticity over multiple time scales and this huge increased um, dimensionality uh, of, of, uh, of signaling. Okay, so having sort of um, uh, put up the case for electrical synaptic transmission, let's move on to, again, uh, this is my mistake. This is actually electrical transmission, not, uh, not chemical transmission. Okay, now let's look at um, chemical uh, transmission. This is sort of the history of chemical transmission. It was uh, discovered out of Levy. Uh, he was playing around with um, uh, frog heart muscle and he realized that if you pour the bath water in which his system was sitting, uh, he could mimic uh, the action of electrical stimulus in this bath uh, where his system was, right? And this, was, uh, this sort of led to the discovery of chemical synaptic transmission in the heart muscle. Um, uh, Bernard Katz discovered it uh, in uh, NMJ uh, motor neurons, and John Echelis uh, discovered it discovered it in uh, in CNS. Um, okay, uh, so give you us sort of a basics of uh, basics of uh, chemical synaptic transmission uh, transmission. Um, it's the most prevalent form of uh, synaptic transmission uh, in definitely uh, humans and mammals. Um, what you see here, the green guy is actually presynaptic terminal. These little balls that you see are synaptic vesicles and we'll talk about those more. This blue guy is the postsynaptic terminal and you see these specialized uh, uh, darker looking areas. These are specialized proteins, networks of proteins. Uh, that are there to receive the signal that a presynaptic neuron sends. And this uh, red guy is actually the enveloping astrocyte. So, you know, uh, and I'm going to make a case for that soon too. Uh, synapses are now, uh, by most modern neuroscientists, considered to be tripart, right? There are three parts. Right? There's a presynaptic terminal, there's a postsynaptic terminal, and there is an uh, uh, enveloping um, astrocyte. Um, and, and, and so this specific area in the presynaptic terminal uh, where the vesicles are prepared or primed, which can actually be released is called the active zone. Uh, this specific, uh, this specialized uh, density is called uh, PSD or postsynaptic density. And these are sort of uh, uh, most uh, uh, common neurotransmitters uh, in your brain. Um, most of the fast neurotransmission is uh, carried out uh, by glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, and the inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, is, is GABA. Okay, so crucial requirements of synaptic transmission. Now, this is, is a real, real mind feed, right? And, and, and there are a lot of uh, open questions uh, in, in, uh, still around. Uh, Tom Suroff uh, got a Nobel Prize a few years ago and he has contributed extensively to this field, right? So here are some of the basic requirements for successful synaptic trans transmission. And you can imagine that each one of this, these on the list recruits a long list of uh, protein machinery that is in place to do this uh, reliably. So you need a mechanism um, for the S synaptic vesicle proteins itself to be manufactured, and these need to be delivered to the synaptic terminal. You need a mechanism for packing uh, 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 a neurotransmitter into synaptic ves vesicles. Uh, you need a mechanism uh, uh, that causes vesicles to spill, spill their contents into synaptic uh, uh, cleft, which is uh, basically exocytose. Um, 
you need a mechanism for producing the electrical or biochemical response in the uh, postsynaptic membrane, right? And then you need several mechanisms to make sure that the exocytos or the fused membranes is, is retrieved after the fu uh, fusion. Uh, and uh, a very important mechanism is removal of neurotransmitter from the synaptic flow. Uh, this is this is very important mechanism because you can imagine you don't want cross contamination of um, temporarily separated uh, signals, right? And you also want, in case of um, excitatory neurotransmission, you also want to make sure that there is no excitotoxicity. That means that the neurotransmitter that is spilled in the synaptic cleft continues to excite the postsynaptic neuron, right? So all, all this makes uh, removal of the neurotransmitter is also extremely um, uh, crucial. And of course, speed is of real essence, right? Because if you need it to be actually communicating sensation, perception, control of uh, movement, then all these things need to happen really rapidly. Um, this is how uh, intense just the vesicle recycling itself uh, looks. Um, I'm not going to go over the poster, of course. This, is what, this would be an entire course, actually. Uh, but uh, I still need you to be somewhat overwhelmed by, uh, by this whole mechanism of uh, vesicle recycling itself. So um, just to give you a quick overview, it includes generation of synaptic uh, vesicle proteins in the rough ER and the diffusion to specific domains. Uh, there has to be sorting that happens uh, in the, in the Gol Golgi apparatus uh, and some of the contaminants might be removed there. Uh, then, the, then, then there has to be budding from this uh, uh, Golgi apparatus. Uh, trans this has to then this whole thing business. This whole thing has to move to the synapse. Uh, the clathrin coating needs to happen. This is uh, quite necessary uh, because it gives the vesicle uh, structural integrity. Uh, the synaptic vesicles have to be filled with the uh, neurotransmitter, and then the synaptic vesicles sort of can at this point remain mobile or. Or, or they can dock what, what I call a specialized network of proteins in the presynaptic terminal called the active zone. Uh, and then when they're docked, they're these, they have to go through a few other kinds of processing so that they can actually be ready to be released. Um, this can, uh, of course, follow uh, this whole business is then, of course, followed by fusion when an action potential comes in, uh, which allows for calcium entry. Um, there are two ways in which, the, in which these vesicles uh, uh, fuse. Uh, one is called kiss and run. Uh, in the kiss and run form of fusion, the vesicle uh, actually do not lose their identity. They just release their content completely. And, but the vesicle identity remains so that the vesicle can be refilled with a, a neurotransmitter. It's a very efficient mode of exercise or uh, synaptic transmission. And then, of course, there's a classical fusion where the vesicle uh, uh, loses its identity in the process of uh, emptying out its um, uh, contents. Uh, one also actually has to worry about um, uh, da damaged proteins and what should be ha what should happen to them. So they need to be tagged, and they should be they should they need to be prepared for uh, retrograde transport so that uh, degradation uh, can take place by the lysosomes. Okay, and so this is really. Uh, very, very simplified picture of what I, uh, what's there in the poster, but do feel free to go and take a look at it if you're interested. Um, now, the entire trick to fast synaptic transmission is to uh, deliver the neurotransmitter at the right place at the right time, right? Uh, and this whole business is carried out uh, by a family of proteins called snares. Uh, now, let me see if I can remember why, what snare exactly. So, soluble N methyl lamide sensitive factor, something like that. So, snare proteins are based and its bi binding partners, a whole bunch of uh, these guys, are basically uh, what are essential uh, for fast exocytosis. Um, and so, the canonical uh, snare complex com 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 is composed of. Um, synaptobrevin, syn syntaxin, and uh, synap25. Um, and they both target the plasma membrane, uh, which you can see here. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons SNARE is a good acronym, acronym is because uh, SNARES allow one membrane to literally snare each other, right? 
these are sort of peptide, uh, or these are sort of lipid uh, loving ends that uh, embed itself in the membrane and the longer tail projects onto the uh, cytosol. So there's V snare, which is basically the vesicle snare and the and, and then there's T snare, which is for the target membrane snare, right? And uh, uh, what, what, what basically allows uh, for fusion um, is, is this interaction between uh, synaptotagmin, which is actually the calcium sensor. So when um, calcium comes in, uh, it binds to uh, synaptotagmins, it engages with these snares and uh, the vesicles can fuse and neurotransmitter can be released, okay? So just to give you a complete uh, picture of this whole business of synaptic transmission, I sort of thought you should please uh, go into some gory details about the protein machine, elaborate protein machinery, machinery involved. Okay, so uh, let's sort of, again, summarize what we've learned so far. Um, you have a presynaptic cell, which is making a synaptic contact with the postsynaptic cell. Um, and you sort of zoom in at this point, right, at the synapse, and you have this presynaptic terminal, and you see these dock vesicles, this is your postsynaptic uh, membrane. Um, let's assume an action potential comes in. Uh, this opens a bunch of uh, voltage-dependent calcium channels, um, and because there's more calcium outside, a bunch, a bunch of calcium comes in, now, synaptotagmins, you see now familiar with the word, synaptotagmins, which are holding these uh, vesicles at the membrane. If enough calcium binds to the synaptotagmins, the vesicle, vesicle fuses, neurotransmitter is released into the cleft. Some of this neurotransmitter actually binds to the receptors that might be sitting on the postsynaptic uh, membrane. And a, a current event might be initiated in the postsynaptic memory. Now, this particular image that you see here is a synapse, very specific synapse, a CA3, CA1 synapse in the hippocampus. Hippocampus is the area of the brain where we believe uh, most of learning uh, is initiated, especially your uh, daily experiences uh, are initiated, uh, the storage of those uh, uh, memories are initiated in, in these synapses. Um, uh, so in this particular synapse, which is central to initiating new memories, uh, what I want to tell you is that the synaptic transmission is very, very unreliable. It's a very low fidelity synapse. It's a very unreliable synapse. So only about 20% of the time an action potential comes in, uh, a vesicle is released. And uh, what I want to tell you is that this is actually not a bug, but a feature. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you of this a uh, bit more uh, later. Uh, so CA3, CA1 synapse, synapse in the hippocampus, highly unreliable synapse, and that actually is an attribute. Okay, I also told you that um, uh, synapses are thought of more as, as tripartite. Right? Uh, so uh, this, this red guy sitting here, and so some of this neurotransmitter that is released in the synaptic cleft, uh, can bind to receptors on the astrocyte. Uh, now, astrocytes, uh, unlike neurons, do not have enough sodium channels. And as, as I mentioned before, one thing you need is a fast sodium channel. So since they don't have sodium channels, they can't fire action potentials. So they are not electrically excitable, but they have this very specialized form of excitability, uh, chemical excitability. So what they do instead of uh, an elevation in their membrane potential, what they do is sh show an elevation in calcium concentration in the cytosol. And once this, uh, uh, once this calcium concentration in the cytosol goes up, this is typically released from the endoplasmic reticulum, this additional excess calcium via IP3 receptors. Uh, I'm again jumping ahead of myself, but some of you might have, a, uh, might have heard of some of these things. And so, uh, they actually use the same currency. They, they, they are also able to release chemicals that are called gliotransmitters. Uh, and some of these gliotransmitters are the same as neurotransmitters. So they, they release uh, glutamate, they release GABA, they release ATP, so on and so forth, right? So this is sort of the uh, uh, cartoon uh, of, of, uh, of or cartoon chronology of a synaptic transmission. So you know that this, the presynaptic terminal is definitely more than an on and off uh, faucet. Uh, in fact, it is actually this monstrosity, right? Now, this is, by the way, is a real a reconstructed canonical synapse in all its glory. 
And you can see it's, it's obviously really, really complex. And um, it's apart from its structural complexity, uh, we already know that a large number of ion channels, a plethora of neurotransmitters and receptors um, that operate over multiple time scales uh, govern its working, right? Um, there are also at least uh, more than uh, 10,000 morphologically distinct synapses, synapses across the brain. And this itself suggests a very intimate, a very strong structure function relationship, right? So given this, again, huge complexity, uh, why bother, right? What's the point? Why, what are we, what is it that, why should we even try to uh, get our hands messy? Why should we bother with this, right? Well, for one, the reason to understand synaptic transmission and changes in synaptic transmission or so-called synaptic plasticities is because it's the cellular underpinning of learning, right? As it turns out, a lot of neurological disorders also seem to have synaptic uh, basis. Um, and so how do you sort of tackle this monster, right? Given this complexity. So one way to do it, do it, or one way to make it tractable is to use computational uh, models, right? And here's where I sort of put in a little pitch uh, for the kind of uh, um, uh, work that we do in the lab. And uh, don't worry, it's completely kosher. This is what the organizers wanted me to do. So um, I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we've been doing, uh, but, First, a pitch for computational modeling itself. Uh, uh, computational models, of course, you know, given this quote from Richard Feynman, what I cannot create, I cannot understand, I do not understand. Uh, computational models uh, in the, can give you an intuition uh, of what to look for um, and where, right? And, and, and we have chosen to look at uh, the CA3, CA1 synapse. So I'm going to talk about our insights on this particular synapse. Um, as, I, as I told you before, it's a small synapse in the hippocampus. It's also a prototype uh, to study uh, plasticity mechanics, right? So it's a good synapse to uh, get a better sense of. Um, and because it's it's a tiny synapse, direct measurements can be somewhat difficult at the synapse. So you know, um, computational modeling can give that added uh, uh, information that you might not have access to. Uh, uh, in, in, in doing wet lab experiments. Okay, so here's actually my favorite uh, motivation uh, for investing in synapses. Um, and these are these amazing uh, papers that came out of the grant lab, said grant. Um, so as it turns out, um, increase in complexity along phylogeny is not just increase in number and uh, connection. This seems to sort of happen in a coordinated fashion, um, right? So what, what uh, Sedgram's lab has shown is that the synaptic proteome itself gets more and more complicated with more complex brains, right? And that's just fascinating to me, right? It's that the, that, uh, that the postsynaptic and presynaptic terminals are molecular systems with highly organized protein networks that then seem to produce, or that can be, I guess, implicated in producing the emergent uh, physiological and behavioral properties, right? Just because of this strong correlation. So I guess uh, in summary, what one can say is that one might not be able to leave out the synapses in order to understand higher function. And uh, needless to say, I belong to the school of thought and so this is where I give, you know, take a quick detour to tell you what our strategy has been um, uh, in the lab uh, to make sense of the synapse. Uh, a lot of the times we divide very detailed 3D uh, biophysical models that we call uh, or, and do what we call in silico experiments. Uh, given that these are um, uh, detailed biophysical models, a lot of our time is spent on calibrating and testing uh, these models with extant experimental data. So we can trust uh, the predictions that come out of it, right? Um, uh, Post-diction is most, one of the most undervalued uh, uh, contributions of computational modeling. Uh, Post-diction uh, is, according to me, is, or according to some of us, is, is making sense of extended. data. And a lot of the times when you just take a, uh, look at the data out there, it appears to be in contradiction to each other. Um, and, and only when you put it together, these, put these pieces together in a, 
in, a, in a computational model uh, can can make sense of this data, right? So uh, um, I would like to put post-diction uh, as as important uh, contribution of computational modeling as prediction. Uh, and of course, um, given uh, the dimensionality again of the space of these models, sort of the, the, the biggest challenge of, of an enterprise like this is what's the relevance of each degree of, uh, uh, of freedom and how do you sort of, how each of these um, uh, constrained uh, function, right? Um, so, um, what I'm going to show you first is, um, you know, really this, the, the, the kind of 3D modeling that I'm talk, going to talk about is, is basically akin to cooking. So what I'm going to show you is that pots and pans, and these are actually um, uh, reconstruction of CA3, CA1 synapses, about 500 of them. Um, and this comes with uh, brilliant music. Uh, Tom made this movie from uh, Terry's lab. Uh, the reconstruction itself was done by Kristen Harris. And I, I, the first time I saw this reconstruction, I was bowled over, like it's mind boggling. So this is your uh, spines, postsynaptic uh, terminals. Um, I should slow down. This is a particular synapse, presynaptic terminal, postsynaptic terminal, making a synaptic contact. The red guys are PSDs, the postsynaptic densities. These are the astrocytes. Um, enjoy the music. I hope uh, some of you are dressed appropriately for this. If not, go quickly and wear your tuxedos. So you see that already the structural complexity, right? I mean, there are all kinds of shapes and sizes. And this whole thing fits in like a Chinese jigsaw puzzle. These are synapse, these synaptic terminals that are coming in. And like I said before, uh, they're about uh, 500 of these. About 40% of the space is for these astrocytes. This is one particular funny guy with, with the ears sticking out. I forget where it was. Oh, uh, so uh, this is actually endoplasmic reticulum. It's supposed to be contiguous. Um, this whole thing came from about five micron uh, plus five micron plus five micron stake of uh, uh, the hippocampus. Uh, at each slice was, so I think, 50 nanometers thick. And it's all stitched uh, uh, together uh, for this kind of reconstruction. And so the reason you, you, you see this uh, ER to be not contiguous is because uh, of the slicing. Diving straight inside um, a spine, and you can see that all these chemicals have to go through these tortuous uh, space. Okay. Uh, I, in interest of time, I'm going to actually move ahead, get a sense of uh, what a synapse really looks like. Uh, so these are my pots and pans. Uh, and then you need ingredients. And so this is sort of an illustrative list of ingredients that, uh, uh, that I put in in my simulations. Uh, these are critical for synaptic transmission, uh, uh, the necessary components for synaptic transmission. Um, there are pumps, uh, uh, there are buffers, uh, there are receptors, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and now, so you have the, the, you have the pots and pans, you have the ingredients, and then you need to uh, give them biophysical properties. So you need to uh, decide uh, or you need to input uh, the, uh, the, the diffusion constants. Uh, uh, the concentrations or the numbers, uh, if they do not move, then you need to figure out what their locations are, or if they are, or if they diffuse on the surface, then you need to know the 2D diffusion constants. 
And, and then uh, what else you need to give your model uh, are there rules of engagement. So if they now, while Rita? they are going around, oh, hi. Hi, we have a quick question. If you, if you can go yeah, back yeah, go a couple, ahead, of, ahead. couple yeah, yeah. of slides uh, where you yeah. had a proposal. This one? No, no, one before, I guess. There, yeah, this no, one? the proposal, the proposal that you have. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, why I, I didn't? Can you just elaborate on this? That uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, so the idea is that um, the 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 especially the proteins associated with with synapses and synaptic transmission and synaptic plasticity itself get more and more uh, complex uh, as you go along complexity of brain. And so the idea is that um, that somehow that this proteome complexity of, of the synapses is also a uh, essential uh, for higher function. I see. So, so one can actually look at a synapse at, at the level of single synapse and say that this is actually a vertebrate or an invertebrate. Exactly. Actually... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just by looking at the proteins, the complexity of the proteins. All good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is not my conjecture. This, this, this are beautiful uh, uh, series of papers from uh, Grant Lab. Um, okay, so uh, then you need to sort of come up with rules of interaction or engagement. So basically you need to have kinetic schemes, right? So when these uh, entities interact with each other while they're doing the diffusion dance, uh, are they going to lead to uh, 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 new products? Uh, what are the rates at which they are going to uh, interact with uh, each other? Uh, and so um, uh, a lot of this uh, can be gleaned from extant data. Uh, they need to be, uh, and then uh, you sort of have to ask if this is sort of appropriate place for them, or you need to tune the rates uh, for it to be appropriate for the model system that you're looking at. And, and, and there are times when you have to actually develop your own kinetic scheme. And this is one of those uh, monster kinetic schemes that we have to develop for vesicle release um, at this particular synapse. Um, and so um, this is my favorite presynaptic terminal, and this is what it uh, 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 looks like. Uh, it's um, uh, it, you sort of see oh, sort of the important components uh, being uh, uh, listed here, uh, annotated. And, and so, you know, you, you sort of have this one caricature synapse and then you can have a canonical synapse uh, with basically average synapse, uh, Joe average. Um, and again, this sort of is zoomed in version of all the important components, right? Okay, now uh, what happens next? Uh, this is sort of the pipeline that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I need to make this. Okay. Um, so sort of the pipeline that I just spoke about, right? You need the surfaces, uh, you need the components, you need the biophysical properties, you need, uh, you need to, uh, you need to uh, give, it, give the kinetic schemes, and then you sort of bring it to life and you allow, uh, you basically uh, carry out Monte Carlo simulations. For this particular thing, we use something called M-cell, which has been developed uh, uh, by Bartol et al. Um, and then because these are Monte Carlo simulations, you typically need to uh, 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 do several of uh, these trajectories. Right, several trials, so that you get a sense of sort of the average behavior, right? But this is as close to reality uh, as you can get. And so um, this sort of time series of what happens, I, uh, uh, I, should, I sort of went through the chronology of events, uh, and this is what it actually looks like. This is a butonic action potential. The butonic action potential opens voltage-dependent calcium channels. This leads to a calcium flux in the cytosol. This is a single trial of local calcium at the active zone. This is averaged over, I think, a thousand trials. Uh, this is the uh, calcium buffers. Now as calcium comes in, these buffers bind calcium. So their, uh, uh, their level drops down. And then these PMCA pumps are going crazy trying to push the calcium out uh, uh, as, as much as, it, uh, as quickly as they can. And this is sort of uh, a single synaptic transmission event, right? Um, and so uh, here, what you see again is, uh, as you zoom in, uh, my favorite presynaptic terminal. Uh, these are the docked vesicles. 
Uh, these are actually voltage dependence calcium channels. And at some point uh, during uh, the simulation, um, an actuating potential come, will come in. These uh, voltage dependent calcium channels will change their color. Uh, and you'll see a lot more yellow balls bobbing around. So at steady state, given that the calcium concentration inside the cell is very low, it's about 100 nanomolar. So in this size of a synapse is about 30 to 40 calcium uh, ions. See, now there's a huge flurry of calcium and they are sort of diffusing around. At some point, uh, enough will bind the synaptotagmins and you will get a successful fusion. Wow, there you go. And so glutamate was released. Uh, a lot of this glutamate was quickly lapped up by transporters. Uh, like I mentioned before, a very crucial aspect of this is uh, clearance of glutamate. So these gems or MNM that you see on astrocytes are the ones uh, which are glutamate transporters. They're lapping up the glutamate. They'll be transported back to presynaptic terminal. And you also see postsynaptic signaling cascades being triggered off here, right? And so uh, one had to do several trials before one got a successful event. In, in this surprising case, you actually get two releases for some strange reason. Uh, you see another one happening really quickly. There you go. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, I should move on again and I'll be happy to put up these movies uh, for the workshop. You can take a look at it, more detail, look at it later. All right. So um, after you saw the real thing, what, what is it? What new insights did we gain from this extremely cumbersome exercise of building up uh, 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 in silico CFECA1? I'll give you a quick uh, tour of. Uh, maybe one or two insights that we got uh, from this already. Um, and we still use it for all kinds to ask all kinds of questions, including uh, 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 what happens to the synapse in Alzheimer's disease. So um, I, I did mention before that there's a huge diversity of synapses, uh, diversity in morphologies, and that suggests a very strong structure function relationship. Uh, with sort of this backdrop, one of the most enduring questions for synaptic uh, physiologists has been to understand the geometrical relationships of various components uh, that govern transmis transmission and uh, plasticity. So, uh, for example, uh, in this particular uh, uh, what came out of this study is that uh, can you guys hear me? By the way, I, I'm getting this message that my internet is unstable. We lost you for a couple of seconds. You lost me for a bit? Okay. Uh, so, oh yeah, all right. So, uh, so, in this, so uh, this particular uh, uh, study shows that uh, the calcium channels uh, that uh, allow entry of calcium uh, into the cytosol, which go on to uh, uh, push synaptic release are very, very close to the active zone. And this allows the synapse to be fast and reliable. Uh, now, what we were looking at, of course, the CA3, CA1 synapse, um, and already mentioned that this operates uh, at, at a highly unreliable rate, right? at low release rate. Uh, and, and I sort of alluded to it that this is an attribute. And the reason it's an attribute is because, you know, one thing you want this synapse to be is plastic. You want, because this is an important synapse for uh, learning. And so imagine if you're already uh, operating at high transmission rates, then the possibility of tuning uh, it up further up doesn't exist, right? So uh, operating at low release probably allows, and that's sort of a simplistic view, but just to give you an intuition of why uh, this is not a bug. Uh, so operating at low release rates allows the synapse to be tunable in an activity dependent manner, right? So this synapse, as it turns out, because of its low release, uh, uh, release rates or release probability of uh, vesicles uh, has a profound ability for short-term plasticity, right? So it can very quickly uh, pump up its release rates. Uh, so what we asked was uh, that this requirement of this synapse to facilitate its uh, release rates in quick duration or short duration of time, does this particular requirement, functional requirement, 
constrain its design um, in any way, right? And, and so we use one of the most popular sort of form of uh, quantifying short-term plasticity. We use what is called a paired pulse ratio. So what is a paired pulse ratio? You sort of give it, give a, a neuron to stimuli, uh, and uh, you watch the postsynaptic response. Uh, if this response to the second stimuli is more than the first stimuli, then the, the then the uh, then you see paired pulse facilitation. If the response to the second one, so it's a ratio of the second to the first, right? And if the response to the second one is smaller than the first response, since it's a ratio, this uh, would be paired paired pulse depression. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the sort of ground truths uh, of this synapse is that it shows this kind of profile for uh, uh, paired pulse facilitation, right? So what you see here is that synapses with low release probability uh, show very high per paired pulse facilitation. And as the synapse uh, release probability of the synapse, uh, uh, there's a distribution uh, that you uh, typically find in these synapses. Most of them operate at low release property, but there are some synapses that also operate at very high release property. And these synapses show very little uh, facilitation. Uh, the way to understand is actually uh, pretty straightforward. Um, one is, of course, that at high release probability, since by just by definition of the pair pulse facilitation, you're already operating at 0 0.95, 0 0.998, or 99. There's very little room to go up. So the ratio always remains low, right? Whereas uh, uh, at low release probabilities, you can get very high ratios, just trivial. Uh, the other uh, reason why you get this ground truth every single time for these synapses is that uh, the, the vesicle, number of vesicles available for uh, release, prime for release, I spoke about priming, remember? The, the, the vesicles have to go through due process before they are actually capable of fusing. Uh, this pool of vesicles actually in the synapses tends to be really, really small. So even though in the EM uh, image, you might have seen 100 or 150 vesicles, they're not all available for release. There's a very small fraction of these vesicles that are actually available for release. And this small fraction is between five to eight, or, you know, average seven vesicles. Uh, so you can imagine if you actually reliably uh, get release uh, in the first, uh, in response to the first stimulus itself, you're depleting your release pool. So you just have less number of uh, vesicles available, lowering the overall release probability. Right? So that's where you get this sort of high uh, paired pulse facilitation uh, uh, for low release probability. And that's what uh, seems to be then the characterizing feature that most synapses uh, operate at low release probability, allowing for high facilitation ratios. Okay. Um, and so uh, what we did was we did these experiments in silico. Uh, what we, uh, and since we're interested in sort of geometrical arrangement, we kind of moved the cluster of voltage dependent calcium channels that trigger release and we put them at different distances. And so these, what these numbers show you is that the distances at which these voltage dependent calcium channels uh, were uh, placed. Now, all with, with the backdrop that of that is fast inhibitory synapses have a tight juxtaposition of calcium channels and vesicles. What we saw uh, was that um, at, at shorter distances, you get minimal, uh, minimal uh, uh, facilitation, whereas as you keep moving the cluster of calcium channels or the source of the calcium farther and farther out, you get more and more uh, facilitation. And the way to un understand this is uh, pretty straightforward, actually. So if you are really close, uh, if a calcium channel is really close to the active zone, then you need no more than maybe one or two to reach a threshold of release of, say, 20%. Right? Now, if you have only one or two calcium channels that need to open, then the total calcium coming in is very little. One of the reason you get facilitation is that some of the calcium that has come from a previous stimulus stays behind. The more calcium there is, the more the probability of it. So when you have a small number of calcium channels that are associated with the release, 
the calcium coming in is very little and there's not much of it left behind before the second stimulus comes in. And so there is the synapse, this synapse has no memory of the first stimulus that has come in. And so you get no facilitation. Now, uh, think about the opposite scenario where the placement of calcium channels is really far out. Now for you to get even to a slow threshold or low release rate of 20%, which is sort of the characterizing feature, you still need tens of calcium channel open up. Sohita, can, can I interrupt? So yeah, go ahead. Can, I, I, think, I think we all missed what you mean by LC. Can you just remind people? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is, these, are, these are the distances at which the calcium channels are placed. So the numbers here are basically is the LC. Right? These are the distances at which the calcium channels are placed Okay, uh, in nanometers. Uh, so at shorter distances, the calcium channels is, is sort of closely juxtaposed uh, to the active zone, then you need only few calcium channels. Uh, few calcium channels uh, imply that the calcium that comes in is very little. Uh, and so the, the, when the second stimulus comes in, the synapse has no memory of the previous stimulus having come in because this calcium that has come in through the first pulse is quickly extruded out. Whereas the opposite scenario is when you have, uh, when you place the calcium channels farther out, hundreds of nanometers away, you need tens of calcium channels in order to reach threshold of 20% release. Uh, and when you, but having had those tens of calcium channels, the global calcium response is much larger. And it takes a much longer time for this calcium to be extruded. And so some of this calcium has stayed back. Uh, in the meantime, the second stimulus comes in. So the global risk calcium response is exaggerated. And this exaggerated calcium leads to a higher release rate right, or a higher release probability. So what this gives you is that the probability of second release grows, grows up, goes up drastically. And therefore, you have a higher PPF for larger distances. This is sort of this qualitative way of understanding this. Right? So we kind of um, led us to uh, made up, make a prediction of a few hundred nanometers away from the active zone. The general canonical geometrical arrangement for this particular synapse. Uh, uh, and you know we predicted about tens of 60 or 70 channels that would be needed in order for uh, us to replicate all the results or get close to experimental uh, uh, measurements of short-term plasticity at the synapse. And this is one of those cases where uh, uh, our theoretical prediction uh, was validated uh, by experiments, some, some of the experiments from Peter Jonas's lab. Um, so that is a pretty cool story. Okay, so one of the things I um, glossed over when I was talking about geometrical arrangement and how extended geometrical arrangement or extended distances between calcium channels uh, and, um, and the vesicles gives you high facilitation rates. Uh, uh, I only spoke about calcium coming from voltage dependent calcium channels. Uh, I also glossed over exactly how well we replicated the uh, experimental results, but hold that thought. Uh, the other thing that we discovered from a reconstruction is that all presynaptic terminals actually had endoplasmic reticulum. Spines, not so much, only the larger spines, the big fat spines that possibly have gone through some kind of plastic structural plasticity tended to have uh, uh, ER, about 20% of the spines had ER. Spines are the postsynaptic numbers. Uh, but each and every presynaptic <coughs> pre terminal had a had an endoplasmic reticulum. And so uh, we sort of went on to ask, uh, in fact, Nishant in my lab went on to ask, what is the role played by the endoplasmic reticulum? in terms of uh, short-term plasticity. How does it contribute to plasticity and specifically short-term plasticity? Uh, one of the ways in which ER can contribute uh, to, to synaptic transmission is by releasing uh, uh, calcium in the cytosol via IP3 receptors. Now, IP3 receptors uh, have been uh, uh, shown to be expressed in the presynaptic terminal quite extensively. Uh, the sort of the pathway of this is that uh, and they might, there might be presynaptic MGLUR term, uh, uh, receptors that um, IP3 receptors and ranadine receptors. Uh, ranadine receptors have been uh, expressed extensively in the presynaptic terminal or seem to be expressed extensively in the presynaptic terminal. 
And so uh, these receptors can open up and cause a calcium flux. And then uh, this calcium can add to the calcium uh, coming in from the VCCs. So that was sort of the hypothesis that we went with and see how is it fast enough to uh, augment or enhance the calcium coming in from the main source, which is the voltage dependent calcium channels. And as it turned out, um, what we saw, uh, Venki, we, we referred to your paper here, um, is that that presence of ER actually allow, uh, give uh, the, the PPR rates to be much closer to experimental data across all experiments, right? So somehow, uh, even though most most uh, most of us don't do not account for this additional source of calcium and, uh, or that another source that modulates calcium dynamics in the presynaptic terminal, our, our computational models seem to suggest that ER plays an important role. And only when we included the activity of ER and the related machinery, basically circa pumps, were we able to get uh, facilitation and other short-term plasticity profiles uh, closer. Uh, to the experimental uh, studies. Um, the point I want to make here is that it's actually, our hypothesis turned out to be quite completely wrong. It was not the calcium release uh, from the, uh, uh, it was not the calcium release from the uh, ER that enhanced the, enhanced the facilitation rates. It's actually the buffering by the circa pumps. Now, circa pumps have a very fast calcium by this, uh, rate. Uh, and so what, what, what we saw is that if you have ER and if you have the right amount of circa pumps, these circa pumps quickly, uh, quickly take up the incoming calcium. Uh, and so you just have a lower global calcium response. You have a lower calcium uh, response. Your P1 goes low. Your P1 goes low, your facilitation goes up, right? So we know this rule of thumb, right? If you have low PR, uh, you have high facilitation. And that's what seems to be the reason to get uh, higher PPF when you have ER. When it came to a train stimuli, of course, um, uh, uh, it was the release from the ER that caused the enhancement of release rates. Okay, now this insight about ER makes a very interesting uh, uh, connection uh, uh, with, with Alzheimer's disease. Now, uh, AD, as we all know, is, is, a, is a catastrophic disease, right? Uh, most likely starts in the hippocampus, uh, the deficits in uh, short-term memory and navigation are tailored that the starting point might actually be the hippocampus. And it quickly, of course, uh, spreads to other brain areas, uh, leading to a constellation of symptoms. Uh, what has been reported clearly is, is, uh, is, is, is blocking of ER in the presynaptic terminal, uh, specifically of the CHPC7 synapses. Uh, seems to uh, replicate the, so these synapses, by the way, let me start off all, all, all over again. So these synapses, uh, AD synapses, seem to show uh, diminished uh, paired pulse uh, ratios, severely diminished paired pulse ratios. What is interesting is that when you block ER in normal healthy synapses, now these are, of course, uh, animal models of Alzheimer's disease. When you block the ER uh, in the normal synapse, it seems to accurately, uh, quantitatively replicate um, the reduced, diminished PPR of the AD synapses, okay? So this sort of suggests that ER has something to do with it. Furthermore, what, what, what experimental studies show is that when you block the ER in AD synapses, you see no effect. So this clearly sort of implicates ER as the ER or the contribution of ER to be compromised uh, 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 in AD, uh, possibly the early most uh, uh, pathological signature as far as the animal models are concerned. And, but however, the exact sort of, uh, there were a lot of, uh, lot of uh, possibilities that are being put out there, but again, it's not very clear the exact chronology of events that leads to compromise short-term plasticity. Over time, this leads to uh, compromise long-term plasticity. So uh, Surbi and Nishant are sort of busy uh, clearing off some of, uh, hoping to clear off at least some of this mess. Okay, so this is sort of to uh, uh, give you a sense of uh, uh, what we do in the lab. Uh, let's go back to uh, synaptic transmission. Um, we, were, we were talking about the CA3 synapse, which is a small synapse with a single, uh, release site and highly unreliable synaptic transmission. Uh, 
how much time do I have? I do have something. So we are going to move to a completely uh, different synaptic design, the neuromuscular junction. This is a connection between uh, uh, axons of motor neurons of the spinal cord and the skeletal muscle. This is characterized by fast and reliable transmission. And this reliability manifests as large number of active zones and almost redundant number of release. It's possibly the largest synapse in your body. Uh, the postsynaptic terminal in this is case is called a motor end plate. And it's it sort of contains a series of shallow poles that you see just now. Uh, the most classic system studied here is the frog and NG, and that's what I'm going to show you. Uh, what you see is these, um, let's see, uh, active zones are sort of precisely li lined up against these uh, folds of the muscles, uh, and which is sort of packed with neurotransmitters. Anyway, without um, much more ado, I'm going to actually show you. Um, another movie of synaptic transmission at a completely different animal, the neuromuscular junction. So here we are. Uh, these guys, oh, maybe should I back up a bit? Uh, okay, so these guys are the vesicles that are lined up nicely along the folds, right? Precisely uh, overlooking the uh, chemical setup ready for them to receive it. Okay. okay, what you want to remember is that the blue glyphs are the unoccupied acetylcholine receptors and they change colors as they get occupied and they bind acetylcholine. Um, okay, maybe a little bit back up a bit. Okay, uh, this is the uh, acetylcholine esterase uh, reaction. Um, these guys are basically esterases that quickly um, uh, take down acetylcholine. Uh, okay, the cyan guy is acetylcholine. This is after it's broken down is choline. Uh, um, the white pearls are the esterases, acetylcholine, acetylcholine esterases that break down acetylcholine, and uh, the blue guys are transporters. Okay, now we see the fun. It's like a, and this only shows you about 20 uh, microseconds of the whole entire action movie. Again, you see the motor end plate. Okay, and these lots of white pearls are actually acetylcholine esterases that are sitting there to make sure that acetylcholine gets broken down very, very quickly. And you see as uh, uh, you see a meteor shower of uh, acetylcholine being released, which is remember it's a cyan color uh, spheres. Uh, the acetylcholine receptors uh, will start changing colors. The unoccupied ones are red, and very slowly you'll see that there are none which are or very few that are left uh, that are red. Okay. Unfortunately, this Tom didn't put music on, on, on this. There you go. So esterase is sitting there to break down acetylcholine. Okay, this is cyan uh, spheres that are coming down. This is meteor shower of so action potential has come in and several vesicles have been fused and oh, this whole bunch of acetylcholine out there, right? And you see that these receptors change colors very rapidly. Oh, sorry, the blue glyphs are the unoccupied ones and they'll slowly change colors as these receptors find acetylcholine. Okay, here, and I'm going to move to the other rest of the time. Okay, oops. I should, uh, I should not mess around with this, should I? Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to not mess around with this. Let's, let's let, let it take its due course. And this sort of takes you through 300 
seconds of this one action potentially coming in at your neuromuscular junction, right? And you just see these uh, receptors changing colors. And this is like Christmas. That was meteor shower, and this is like Christmas. Christmas has come early. Okay, so you get a sense of these two diff completely different designs. Um, uh, I think maybe I'm going to move ahead. Okay, so uh, where are we? We spoke about uh, synaptic transmission, why it is important. We spoke about computational modeling and the kind of insights that can, uh, detailed biophysical modeling can give you. Uh, and so we are at a point where we are releasing uh, chemicals, neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. Uh, what happens to this uh, neurotransmitter that gets released in the synaptic cleft? Uh, there are two, two ways in which it can jumpstart a signal in the postsynaptic uh, uh, membrane. Uh, one is a ligand gated ion channel, which are basically proteins uh, that form to form a pore. And when the ligand, when the neurotransmitter binds to it, this pore sort of opens up and allows a particular type of channel uh, ion uh, to go through. Uh, what I show you here is the action of uh, GABA. And as I mentioned before, GABA leads to inhibitory transmission. So what this does is that when GABA is released, the postsynaptic membrane is taken further away from its threshold of uh, 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 firing action potential or is inhibited. And the reason it is in inhibited is because the membrane gets hyperpolarized. And the reason it gets hyperpolarized is that when GABA binds, uh, uh, to the GABA receptors, it allows chlor chlor chloride uh, to go in. When chloride goes in, uh, the membrane becomes, of course, um, hyperpolarized. Now, um, of course, uh, GABA makes the system uh, less excitable, right? Uh, but you can imagine that, or you, uh, and I already gave you a sense that there's more to inhibitory transmission than just making the system uh, less excitatory. Of course, without GABAergic GABA transmission or without inhibition, we would probably be seizuring uh, all, all the time. Uh, but GABA or inhibitory transmission is, is important to, uh, uh, to generate rhythms. It's in fact also crucial uh, for synchronous activity of neurons, given that there's so much uh, uh, noise in the background, that the brain is a noisy system. What inhibition does is that makes sure that it, 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 it that it at every now and then brings systems together so you can get synchronous activity. And this has been shown by several labs, right? You cannot get synchronized activity of neurons without, uh, it's like having a speed breaker and then you wait for the others to come. Uh, so that you can start all over again, right? So uh, without GABA, uh, the speed breaking by GABA, you wouldn't get uh, synchronous activity. Okay, so that was inhibitory transmission. Then of course you have excitatory transmission uh, mediated by glutamate receptors. Uh, prominent glutamate receptors are of course NMDA and AMPA. Um, both uh, receptors uh, allow sodium to go in, which means it depolarizes the membrane. So this is excitatory neurotransmission. Additionally, NMDA receptors also allow calcium um, to go in. Now, this is a very important attribute of NMDA receptors because calcium is being implicated in all plasticity, initiating all plasticity mechanisms. And a lot of the plasticity mechanisms have to do with NMDA receptors. So this entry of calcium via NMDA receptors is very, very important. Uh, the NMDA receptor in general is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it, it merely glutamate is not enough for it to start conducting. Uh, it also needs the membrane to be depolarized. And so very often uh, uh, AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors are closely juxtaposed together so that the depolarization caused by AMPA receptors can aid uh, opening uh, of, of uh, uh, of NMD receptors. Okay, so now let's look at um, G protein uh, mediated uh, neuro neurotransmission. Uh, these are of course characterized by slower, uh, long lasting and very diverse postsynaptic action. So 
what just to sort of highlight qualitatively give you a sense of the list of steps for this as well uh, neurotransmitters can of course bind to uh, receptor proteins which are again embedded in the postsynaptic membrane uh, these receptor proteins activate by, by uh, g proteins and that's why it's called a g protein uh, mediated transmission um, these G proteins are free to move uh, along the membrane. They are actually surface diffusing. Uh, these G proteins can go and activate what we call effector proteins. Uh, now, these effector proteins can be a, also a ion channel, and therefore, therefore, it can uh, again change uh, the membrane potential simply, or they can be M enzymes that synthesize molecules. Uh, which are called second messengers. And they can diffuse into the cytosol. Second messengers can also activate additional enzymes and so on and so forth. And in the end, uh, can regulate the function of ion channel or alter cellular uh, metabolism. So that's why they're also called metabotropic, metabotropic receptors. Uh, in this specific example or the cartoon example uh, uh, that I put out here, um, what I show you is, uh, uh, Binding of norepinephrine uh, to the receptor triggers a cascade of biochemical reactions. Uh, the receptor seems to first activate a G protein. Uh, this in turn activates a, what we call an effector protein or an enzyme adenyl cyclase. Um, adenyl cyclase catalyzes conversion of uh, ATP or adenosine triphosphate into CAM. Uh, and, and and this protein kinesis, uh, the, so, so, so this CAMP actually stimulates uh, another protein called protein kinase. And this protein kinase uh, can catalyze a chemical reaction called phosphorylation. In this case, is phosphorylation of K channel, potassium channel. This phosphorylation causes the potassium channel to close sooner, uh, thereby reducing the potassium conductance. So what happens when ultimately after this whole series of steps, what are you getting in the end? You are getting early closing of potassium channel, uh, which means the membrane, uh, what's, it, what's it going to do? Less potassium is going to go out, right? So it's going to make the cell more excited. OK, so this was all neurotransmission. We looked at uh, two, uh, 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 and we looked at the postsynaptic post uh, uh, signaling cascade via uh, ligand and via G protein mediated pathways. Uh, there is something called uh, neuromodulation, which is distinct from neurotransmission. Uh, neuromodulators are special because they do not directly target select, select single synapses. Um, and, and so there's no immediate uptake of neuromodulators either. So what this means is that the time scales of their operations are much slower, you know, orders of magnitude slower. Uh, these the receptors of neuromodulators are expressed widely all across CNS. So we, one likes to think of them as, as or, or the activity of uh, neuromodulators as volume transmission. And so they sort of form a diffuse signal that can have a global impact on activity of the brain, right? There's something to uh, keep in mind. Don't have time to go into details about that. Um, and I don't have much time to talk about fascinating and important properties of the it's the capability uh, of, of, of any neural activity generated by an experience. So the neural activity generated by an experience can modify neural circuit and thereby modify subsequent experiences, feelings, thoughts, etc. right? So it's quite special. And so it's this activity dependent modification of synaptic strength or efficacy uh, is what of pre-existing synapses is what we call uh, synaptic plasticity, right? Uh, and this, of course, has been uh, uh, proposed to play a central role in storing experiences um, into into um, into uh, into persistent uh, memory traces, right? Now, uh, 
plasticity of course comes in many forms synaptic transmission can of course be enhanced or depressed and so on and so forth it can span uh, multiple uh, temporal uh, scales right from milliseconds to hours to days and presumably all your life right uh, and all synapses uh, in the mammalian brain can express large variety of uh, synaptic plasticity all at the same time uh, the basic idea that that uh, the changes in synaptic strength might be the basis of storing information was formulated by Hebb. Uh, he sort of insisted on a causal ring, right? A, a synapse should be strengthened if a presynaptic neuron repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing the postsynaptic uh, uh, one. And so it says a causal link between the pre-firing of the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, this is wrongly attributed quote cells that fire to him cells that fire together why together as it turns out it, he never said that however the reason it's a bit loose is because there is, there is no suggestion of a causal link you know, the neuron the brain is a noisy system two neurons might be randomly firing together that doesn't mean uh, they should be a plastic chain between their connection okay so uh, hebb insisted on a causal link uh, so it's been difficult right to connect uh, plasticity uh, to memory and learning and you know for the obvious reasons uh, synaptic changes are small and local and therefore it's hard to measure these specific changes associated with a particular experience uh, learning involves both strengthening and weakening so in the end you would, might not have an overall global change and, and you might not have right pharmacological agents to as a specific pharmacol uh, pharmacological agents and there are all these compensation mechanisms also in uh, so how much do we know? We know a little bit about the molecular mechanisms and what happens when they are disrupted. We have a general idea of what part of the brain participates in what kind of memory function. Uh, but it's the in-between. What is a physical instantiation of a memory? Is that uh, uh, we are not there yet, but we are, I have to tell you that we're inching close to it uh, via this whole new understanding of what we call memory engrams. And I'm going to give you a little bit about it before I uh, close uh, for today or uh, when the, before the show is over for me today, okay? Uh, so, 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 Sweetha, can I interrupt? Yeah. I think so we have, yeah. we have only about seven minutes or so before thing. I don't know if, how much time we want to leave for questions. Uh, okay, so do you want me to just uh, stop at that? I can I, I, stop it's at up that. to you, but I feel like- It's a good place to stop. Yeah, I think the students have been very quiet, so I think maybe they have questions once we stop. <laughs> sure. So, so yeah, uh, this is a good place to stop. Uh, I, I bet people have heard about memory engrams and they can go back and uh, read about it. Okay. I yeah. am going to stop sharing. Um, you can, I don't know if you don't mind, you can also share the slides. I think we can sure, upload I the could. whole Yeah, of course. Thing yeah, I, 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 I would do that. Yeah. Say, um, I'm going to start my video, but you know, let me know if it, my voice breaks and I'll turn it off again. It's just nice to see people. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a there was a question I think uh, related that maybe this might be worth elaborating. It's like you know the the temporal correlation of firings is this between pairs of neurons in in this head formulation, but obviously other neurons are influencing the firing too, right? So like, how does one you know to think about this? Oh, that's a that's a that's a hard one. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, that's a hard one. Uh, yeah. So 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 we have sort of neuroscientists have thought about this, right? There's the homosynaptic plasticity and heterosynaptic plasticity, uh, and uh, and so synapses that are indirectly get, getting influenced by uh, activity of neighboring neurons are are. Uh, are actually compensating for the changes that are happening at that synapse. And that's what, what we call the heterosynaptic plasticity. Um, uh, the, the, the chemical signaling uh, uh, underlying uh, synaptic plasticity uh, makes sure, ma ensures its specificity. So in fact, the way we've thought of long, and we didn't have time to go, go get into it, but the way we have thought of uh, long-term plasticity or the molecular players uh, that can actually be pinned down for long-term plasticity associated with imprinting memories is, is specificity of this uh, signal, right? So uh, only those synapses 
uh, that are causally linked to the presynaptic neuron uh, uh, are engaged in these changes. And in MDA receptors, why are there lots of technical detail that I didn't have time to get into today, but for example, uh, NMD receptors are called coincident uh, detectors also. And uh, the reason is, uh, is because of they're able to maintain the requirement of specificity of, of, of the signaling or maintain the causal link. And um, how do I say this without, uh, with, without not adding new information to this? Um, I, I, I think, so I think broadly, that question, Sweet. I think that yeah, I think the mechanistic details. I think that are important, and I think, as you say, it might you know might be hard to get into. But yeah. I think the uh, I have a feeling that the some of the um, I wouldn't say confusion. But the, the things is like how do you even get these kinds of coincidences, right? Because you have a network of neurons, and the point yeah. is that that's a network property, right? When you have lots of yeah. things converging, and if two neurons that are connected just happen to systematically fire together many times statistically, then that synapse gets strengthened, right? But to so, think so, about how those things fire together, that's that's often a network property. I think that maybe that's the confusion in this question that's asked. Okay. Uh, but any other questions from people? I don't know if people can type in or I don't know, raise the hand, whatever way. You guys just look tired. There's a lot of new information. I'm sorry. It's, it's just very, very uh, condensed. Almost, yeah, BJ. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so either I had a, uh, maybe a dumb question. Yeah. So, so okay. you use very realistic geometry uh, right, to right. do the simulation. I wonder how important that that really is. I mean, given that it's more stochastic firing, that really would, would matter. So I'm just wondering. So, so the, as far as I can tell you, uh, size matters. Uh, uh, you know, and, and and that's just simply because of the concentrations uh, uh, change with size, right? And uh, you know, calcium concentration is a very important uh, teller of the downstream signaling. Um, whether the sizes, uh, whether uh, I uh, I am yet to. Um, I, I don't think I can say with any confidence that you know uh, uh, shapes have had any significant effect on transmission or, or plasticity. Um, mm -hmm. So sizes matter, shapes. I'm not sure, but there, there's been some uh, uh, work on uh, how uh, the tortuosity of the ex ECS, the extracellular space, uh, changes uh, volume transmission. And apparently, this is also a dynamic uh, thing that you know it, it, the 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 ECS changes. Uh, you know when uh, have changes with uh, when you're asleep, it ECS changes. Uh, uh, it's different for pregnant women or pre uh, pregnant females, and so on and so forth, right? And so that seems to also be a dynamic uh, plastic feature of the of how the brain works. Mm -hmm. ECS is uh, extracellular space. It's the space between presynaptic and yeah. postsynaptic that corrals the chemicals yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the no, right but, direction. But the realistic geometry that you use, the meshing and things yeah. like that. Yeah, so, so, so those are sort of a, a illustration of uh, uh, you know, a single instantiation of my favorite synapse, right? It gives give you a sense of in silico experiments. We very often actually use canonical geometry. We have a sense of the average size, uh, width, and so on and so forth. Uh, since these are, of course, uh, looking at chemical signaling uh, and spatial modeling, uh, and and you know this kind of questions that we're interested in, uh, space becomes important. Uh, sizes become important, uh, but not not uh, details of, of the synapses per se, as far as I can tell. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I, you know, one can say things are different in a small synapse as compared to a big synapse or a medium uh, size synapse that you can go from plasticity to, uh, from potentiation to depression uh, if, uh, just by changing synapse sizes, uh, but that's about it. And having said that, you still sort of, uh, you know, if you look at the diver, if you, I don't know if you remember the reconstruction, you see this uh, huge diversity in shapes. I don't think our tools we are using are as sophisticated, sophisticated to understand how these shapes matter. Maybe it's just uh, fitting in. You saw the whole, whole, whole thing fits in like a Chinese, Chinese jigsaw puzzle. Uh, maybe it's uh, some kind of structural optimization that leads to these you know, very rich um, shapes. 
I, I, I'm just sort of uh, puffing right now, right? I have no idea. Any other questions? I think there's another question, right? There's somebody who said, ask, uh, should I owe? I can, I can check, check the chat too. There. Yeah, I think the, the, there's the latest one. Uh, somebody's asking, where can we read up more about this, the usual question, right? I mean, there's just so much material. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can point to some so I, textbook, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's basically, this is, you know, like I said, you know, my yesterday's lecture is one textbook, uh, and I'm sorry, you know, it's, it's, but I, I still feel like I owed you a, a flavor of uh, all the things that go into uh, synaptic transmission and synaptic plasticity, and, you know, given that you're in the field, I'm, it's very hard for uh, me to let go of certain details so, today, so I, you know, hopefully I, yeah, loaded you uh, with lots of details, I, I, I hope all of them were important. Or oh, do neurotransmitters leak out of synapses? No, they don't. Synapse, uh, uh, membranes are not permeable to neurotransmitters leaking out. Oh, so it's, pa it's past, um, I guess, the schedule time, Vijay. I don't know if you want to break for, um, yeah, for some time take, for the next we, one. We can take a 30 minute break and, and then come back for 80 and second talk. Yeah, you guys can. Um, Oh, LC, I'm sorry, I had all these acronyms. I, 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 yeah, yeah. So what is LC? LC was just an acronym for the distance between the calcium source and the vesicles. It's sort of to describe the geometrical arrangement between uh, in, in the presynaptic domain. Okay, then we can. Uh, take thank you, Sweta, for, for the lectures. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank Sunita. you for having me. This, uh, this would have been a lot more fun if I actually had a chance to interact with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this feels like a punch in your stomach giving a lecture <laughs> like this, honestly. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, you, know, you can't, yeah, it's no fun. You know, I can't see your faces. I do, can't see if you're bored or energized or whatever. So, yeah. I, I do hope this is the last time we have to do this, right? I hope we are over it. <laughs>